in, in many other parts of the Southwest. And that gathers up into creeks like the Gila and the Membrus and uh, the tributaries of the Rio Grande on coming off the Black Range. So you have permanent water most of, in most of those valleys, uh, usually in manageable quantities. Uh, Rio Grande's a little big and the Gila's a little big for people to, to use. It flows out into the Chihuahuan Desert, where basically you've got a really nice long growing season. So it's just an ideal place for people to do whatever they wanted to do. Um, to the north, you had Anasazi or Ancestral Pueblo. I'm going to use the term Anasazi because historically it's important. You'll see why in a minute. Uh, and, and in Pueblo as well. Uh, that's to the north. And just for what it's worth, uh, you know, immediately to the north, there's a zone that you might think was Mugion or Anasazi. Well, uh, that little star on top, it says Camelot, is approximately where the southeasternmost Chaco and Great House is that I know of. It's a site called Camelot on the San Augustin, and I'm not going to explain that now. If somebody wants to ask me the question and answers, I'd be happy to. That's about 40 miles. Steve? 40 miles to the north. Can I interrupt? I, I'm not seeing any screen here other than you. Are you? Um... Yeah, I've shared screen. Um, Al, can you see it? Yeah, that's probably my fault. Let me take the spotlight off of you. Oh. It's just me. Sorry. So are we okay? Can you see it now, Bill? Yeah, others are saying they can see it. So go ahead, Steve. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, but Bill, there's all these pictures of you in here. <laughs> Well, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, the, the Camelot, which is this great house, um, is about 40 miles north of the northernmost member site that I know of. So they're neighbors. Um, they're, they being the Chaco, Anasazi, Ancestral Pueblo, and members which are contemporary. To the west, you got Hoakam, and we'll talk about how close they get. They butt up right against each other. To the east, you've got Hornada, and I did a bunch of work in Hornada uh, back in the day. And I won't talk too much about it tonight, but but there's some you know, that's in, in, there are implications for members in Hornada. And of course, to the south, you've got the Casas Grandes region in uh, in northern Chihuahua. So I'm going to look north, south, east, and west. Uh, actually, north, west, south, and east. I think this is how that, how this goes. But I'm also interested in context. Not, you know, that's geographic context. I'm interested in, in chronological context. I'm interested in, this is always worth doing. Dropping back and going, well, what happened before and what happened after? And there's often not a straight line between those and what happened during, obviously. It's not a straight line, but it, you know, it's interesting to think about the context of the during is members. What came before it, what came after it, and what does that tell us about members? So let's start with Hoakam which I dabbled in a little bit. Uh, I tried to be a Hoakam archeologist and it wasn't a very good one, but I, tried, I did visit a lot of sites and talk to a lot of people and hopefully learn some stuff back when I was living in Tucson. And some of the, you know, the salient characteristics of Hoakam uh, that comes together, uh, well, the canals are very you know, early and often, but things that come together, maybe 700, you know, 650, 700, 750. You have the canals, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, very impressive, uh, much more impressive than anything Chaco ever did. And then this uh, burial uh, practices of cremation and al almost certainly involve these pallets, which Emil Howery called a calling card of Hoakon, um, which are schist uh, objects. Um, they're all different sizes, but you know these probably are maybe eight inches or nine inches long and you know three or four, uh, four or five inches wide. Um, and, you know, beautifully made. Red on buff pottery, of course, which is, you know, the characteristic of Hocom, and, and shell. Uh, these are glycemerous shell, which uh, Jim Bayman said were, was the mark of being a Hocom person, is he wore glycemerous shell bracelets. But cut shell, uh, on sort of on industrial scales, they worked they work shell. And we'll come back to all this stuff. Let, let's follow those four out, and then we'll get, we'll get to some other stuff. But first, I really like architecture. Uh, canals don't move around, but all the rest of the stuff moves around. Architecture is really interesting, uh, and I'll get to that in, in a minute or two. That um, the house forms are, are interesting here too, and I'm going to emphasize that at the end before I go through these. After I go through these four, the canal irrigation 
you know, canal irrigation is way old in Hohokam, you know, 1200 BC or like, I don't know what the latest dates on it are, but you know, Hohokam did canal irrigation really early and got it right and really knew how to do it. Well, to, to farm in the members country where you got this water coming down the Gila, coming down the members, coming down the smaller creeks, going out the Chihuahuan desert, you have to get the water to the land. It doesn't rain enough there to grow corn at all. So they had to use canal irrigation, but they didn't have to invent it. I mean, their neighbors had been doing it for a millennia or more than a millennia, millennium, excuse me. Um, and there are canals in the in members for sure. Uh, Laverne Harrington, who's an archeologist uh, out of Texas a and had a sort of fossilized members uh, canal system, the whole system on her family ranch there near Silver City that hadn't been subsequently farmed and plowed and all that kind of stuff. So you actually see the whole thing. And then you see bits and pieces of them. So, you know, members are using canal irrigation, which of course they're not doing up north. Uh, all through this, I'm gonna compare this to that and say which, you know, this and this and this and this and say, what's more similar? Well, members is a whole lot like Hoacom, but Anasazi and Central Pueblo are not doing canal irrigation at this point. Um, so yeah, these two are early on anyway, are much more alike. The cut shell, uh, I mentioned the, the glycimerous bracelets, which are not shown here, um, but ho those are a big part of Hoakam. Well, they're a big part of members too. And members, you actually have them on burials because they, you know, they did cremate some, I'll talk about that in a minute, but they did inhumations and they're, they're burials that come out where somebody has, um, you know, like 40 or uh, 30 or 40 of these things on their upper arm. They're not bracelets, they're armlets. Um, so yeah, members is all about uh, glycemia shell, bracelets, armlets, whatever they are. You got a few of them up north, uh, but not many. And sometimes they're mounted on as, as uh, necklace, you know, tinklers on necklaces and stuff. What you're looking at here is cut shell, which is a whole kind of specialty. And two um, plates from two different site reports. One on the right is from a member site. It was published like 27, something like that in the 20s, um, where they found a cache that contained those cut objects. And two guys, two birds, going after a snake, I think, and there's other odds and ends. Years later, uh, they were working on the citrus site, it was Bill Wasley and I forget who else, uh, and a, uh, a salvage archeology. span And that's as far west as Hoacom gets, basically, that's Hilo Bend. And there's, I don't, I can't, uh, my slides are obscured by some pop-ups here, but I, I think it's like 600 miles, somebody, I think it's written down there, apart. And the guys that were working in citrus, you know, found another cache like this, and they remembered seeing this site report from the members in 1927. So they arranged these things for their site report to mimic, to mirror the members stuff. I mean, this, this is not stuff you see up north at all, but you've got it in the members, and this isn't the only explanations or, or example. And you certainly have it all over in Hoacom. So here again, it's, you know, real Hoacom, uh, interests in members, so they're paying a lot of attention to what's going on to the West. Um, Hoakam had these pallets that I think are associated, a lot of people think are associated with cremations, which is the burial pattern. Um, members did a few cremations, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but they had pallets too, uh, this, where Hoakam is made out of schist and uh, members is made out of slate and some other metamorphic rocks. Um, and they, you know, they don't look exactly like a Hoakam pallet. You can see this one from a side view. But they're they're definitely doing the pallet thing, uh, you know, with the use wear and all that sort of stuff. And my favorite is this one down below, in the Deming Museum, which is a you know a replica of a pallet in pottery. <laughs> you know, they, they love the, the members likes the form, and you know they they're dressing up and wearing using this stuff. Maybe they don't actually get the message, but they're they're certainly paying attention to what's going on to the West. And they do cremations. I mean, members is famous. And I'll get to this later about how many inhumations they have. Um, but also recent, you know, fairly recently, uh, you know, last couple of decades, um, Harry Schaefer, I think first discovered at Nan Ranch Ruin in the Members Valley that we've been digging in rooms because that's where the burials are and that's where the pots are and the pots are with the burials and not paying attention to the plazas and Harry being a good archeologist and not being completely, you know, blinded by the pottery, um, worked in the plazas and he found all these cremation pits and he found, you know, cremations that were gathered up and put in in uh, seed jars with cover jars, you know, very much like like Hohokam does. And I, when I excavated Sage of Farland, we found some cremations just that same way. So by and large, they're doing inhumations, but some people are being, some dead people there are being treated like Hohokam. They're, they're doing the, the Hohokam 
uh, treatment of the dead. Uh, Holocom red on buff, uh, lots of people have noticed this, that muggy on red on brown, which is one of the, the first decorated types in the, in the members area. When you say buff, I say brown, let's call the whole thing off. I mean, it, you know, the, the color patterns are the same. A lot of the designs are similar. And where the Holocom stuff is paddle and anvil, a lot of the mugging on red and brown and the related types of its time, and this is early, or late, excuse me, late pit house period, the exterior surfaces are dimpled, uh, you know, maybe to, to mimic how a, a paddle and anvil thing, I think they, they're made by coiling, but I think they, they actually texture the outside with dimples uh, to make it look like it got whacked with a, with a hammer and anvil. Um, even the figurative stuff, which is so, you know, the most famous thing the members ever did are figurative pots with, you know, pictures of this and that. Holcom was doing that before members. And um, you look at the earliest uh, members images, and these are you know, what they call transitional, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, they're not that far off of, of what Holcom people are doing. I mean, look at that horny toad or whatever it is in the lower left and the same thing, you know, right next to it. Um, it's quite possible that, that Hoacom uh, pioneered that, you know, sort of figurative art and members picks up on it and runs with it. I mean, you know, they, they leave Hoacom in the dust um, artistically. Um, but there's certainly a lot of similarities there early on. And again, all this is before 1000 AD. Remember this, that's a key date. I didn't emphasize that, but all the stuff in the Hoacom is before 1000 AD or CE. Okay, so houses. I mean, I really like architecture and I really like doors. Um, convinced of reading and talking to people, you know, doors are really important. Uh, these are Holocom houses and a couple of reconstructions. Uh, one in the upper right's probably all fallen to ruin now. It used to be at the Gila Heritage Center. One on the left, I think, is one that uh, you guys can correct me, but I think Archaeology Southwest put that together. And then there's a drawing of what a Holocom house would look like, the, the framework. And okay, so what is a before 1000 AD, what does a member's house look like? Bingo. It's got a door, it's got a ramp entry, just like Holocom. It's deeper, you know, step entry, whatever. The way you get into it is through this ramp entry and the member stuff is, you know, it's usually deeper. Um, and there's all, you know, all kinds of technical differences. I'm not saying that they're identical, they're not tract homes, but the doors are the same. Okay, so if you look comparatively, and this is the only slide I have that's like this, where I'm, you'll have to take my word for it when I say Anasazi doesn't have that or Holocom doesn't have that. These are floor plans of roughly contemporary um, pit structures before 1000 AD. With the Holcom members, they both have the ramp entry, the step entry, whatever you want to call it. And then there's one up north where they're coming in the house from a ladder through the roof, all right? Couldn't be more different. Or a ladder into an antechamber, you know, that, that's a sort of igloo uh, kind of uh, thing in, in front of the pit house. They're not coming through a ramp entrance. So, you know, given these three, and I, I really like comparisons because it's one of the most robust logics archaeology can use. I mean, we can't tell you why the door is important, but we can tell you which doors look alike. This is a no-brainer, all right? The early member stuff looks like Holocom houses, not like Anasazi houses. Um, and it looks a lot like Holocom houses. Okay, ball courts, you all know, uh, the Arizona people anyway, the ball courts are a big part of Holocom. Um, and I, I think that's Adamsville, I'm not sure. Um, some avocational archaeologists, very knowledgeable avocational archaeologists, thought that there were ball courts at member sites on the Gila, but they were pretty subtle. You know, I was expecting ball courts like this one to jump way up or the ones at Snake Town. But when I was down visiting Hoacom sites, um, trying to learn about Hoacom, I saw some ball courts that were pretty damn subtle. Um, you know, they were real, but you know, they, they weren't towering up over your head. Um, and it's quite possible. I've done a lot of surveying the members up and down the Rio Grande, up and down the Gila, and a lot of other places. That I'd walked over things that I said is that's an odd shaped pit house depression, and it thing is oval. Could have been a ball court. Who knows? I mean, you, you see what you expect to see, and I wasn't expecting to see ball courts. But for what it's worth, one of the biggest ball courts in the Hocom is at Pueblo Viejo. It's also called Solomonsville, in the Safford Valley. It's one of the biggest ones, and it's the easternmost, and it's just 50 miles from the biggest member site, which is the Red Rock. It's the biggest member site. It's 50 miles. I mean, uh, um, Taro Mara guys, they, they timed them. They brought them up to Texas and timed them. They could run like 90 miles in 15 hours. Of course, it was the flat part of Texas, but 
you know, that's nothing. 50 miles is nothing. So they're basically neighbors. So around 1000 AD, they get out of the pit house villages and they wake up one morning and say, let's build stone pueblos. And originally the thought here is that was pretty quick. Um, I think it actually took a while for them to transition from the pit houses. And I think other archaeologists would accept that, you know, wouldn't have any problem with that at all. That it didn't happen overnight. But, you know, in 1000 AD, all the dates I'm given, you know, you know, plus or minus, you know, 50 years or a century, whatever, I'm just throwing in dates as, as signposts. But 1000 AD has got some historic significance too, as you'll see in a minute. Um, so, yeah, they, they get out of those pit house villages and start building stone pueblos, which is kind of a radical change. Um, and some of those pueblos get fairly large. Lower right there, you see Pueblo Benito. These are all the same scale. Pueblo Benito. Uh, Old Town is one of the bigger ones in the Members Valley to the left of it. Galaz is one of the bigger ones. Swartz is uh, one of the Members Valley pueblos. It's very compact, or it's you know it's all very densely occupied, um, dense architecture. It's not spread out like the other two. The biggest ones are in, the, like I say, is in the Members Valley. Uh, Red Rock's the biggest, and Woodrow up near Cliff is the, the second biggest. The biggest ones are in the Members Valley, but there are more member sites and more members people in the Members Valley. This is not the, you know, my valley is better than your valley. This is just, these are facts. These are interesting facts that, you know, we need to say, well, what's that mean, if anything? Um, so, they, you know, they're fair sized. And this is when they start, when they, when they start building those pueblos is when they start making that pottery that we love so much with, uh, you know, bugs on the upper right and a macaw on the lower right and a bat. And then what's probably a monkey with a couple of macaws uh, upper left. We love this stuff and we put it on t-shirts. In fact, I had a t-shirt on today that Kathy made me take off and put on a real shirt with a collar um, that had members design on it. And you can't go in a gift shop in Santa Fe without seeing, you know, members handbags and trivets and whatever. We like this stuff, but I'm not sure anybody else did at the time. It doesn't travel outside the members area. And I think even the cute stuff, stuff we think is cute is really ideologically heavily, heavily charged because, you know, you might eat your Wheaties out of these things, but then there's these, okay? Lower, lower right guy's taking another guy's head off. Guy wearing a, a horn serpent rig is taking another guy's head off. Upper left, I don't know what's going on there, but somebody's in trouble. I mean, it's bad news for someone. Um, and there, these scenes that they paint on these pots, like I say, don't leave the member's area. And I think you wouldn't want this stuff if you weren't a member's person and, uh, Part of, you know, part of that worldview, part of that culture. Uh, Chaco Canyon's immediately, uh, no, excuse me, exactly contemporary with, with members and Chaco could have anything it wanted pretty much. Um, it didn't want this stuff. You know, they flipped lots and lots of shirts from Chaco and there's almost no members, even though they're exactly contemporary. And so, you know, whatever these picture pots were, I think they were hot and they were dangerous and they were, you know, you had to know what they meant to, to be using them. Most of the members' pots aren't those picture pots, you know, the figurative pots, they're geometrics. And uh, they're wild too. I mean, it could go on for a while, but Anna Shepard basically getting cross-eyed trying to figure out all the, the symmetries in, in these pots. Um, early on, uh, they recognized two types, bold face and classic, which in the Southwestern nomenclature, this is in the twenties, when the Southwestern pottery nomenclature gets regularized, uh, you have a place name and then a descriptor like Mangus, which is a creek, Mangus Creek, black on white, and Membris, which of course is the Membris River, black on white. So that's what they call these things. Um, the Mangus is earlier and the Membris is later. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, um, the Members Foundation, uh, Harry Shaper's Nan Ranch Project, and, and some other folks um, sorted, sorted this out, uh, the, the sequence of pottery down there. And it's interesting because the, the style, okay, they decided that Mangus and Boldface and classic members um, really were just styles of one type. And, and this is one of the more, for, for those of you that are interested in Southwestern ceramic typology and taxonomy, um, all four of you out there, this is really a, an interesting episode. For the rest of you, just zone out for a minute. Um, in the 70s, they decided that no, it was all one type, members black and white, that went through three stylistic evolutions, style one, style two, which is transitional, style three. And these are real, I mean, people can recognize these, but they, they are sequential and they span 400 years. And the way Southwestern pottery usually works, those would be three separate types. 
<laughs> they're one type that lasts 400 years. There aren't, I can't think of any other decorated type that lasts 400 years. There was an agenda here when they decided it was all members black and white and it was just different styles. And they wanted to emphasize continuity because the in the 70s and 80s, the when people came into the, the members, the prevailing notion was discontinuity. Major disjunction, disjunction at 1000 AD. That's why I keep using 1000 AD. Uh, with Anasazi swamping, which is a term that actually got used a little bit. And this is coming from Emil Howry, who's the man who defined Mugion in the first place um, and who I got to talk to a lot towards the end of his life. When I was at work in Arizona State Museum, I'd walk across, you know, I was in the North Building, he was in the South Building. I, I, he was retired and I'd go talk to him. And since I was working on members at the time, he, we talked about members a lot. And he he thought that 1000 AD, Mugion ends, and you have those guys turning basically into a, some Southern extension of the Anasazi, or at least, you know, putting on those clothes. And to his dying day, he believed that. Uh, this is one of the last things he wrote about it, and it's part, I'm afraid it's partly obscured, so you're going to have to read it yourself. A person knowledgeable in Anasazi remains taken blindfolded to the classic member sites, surely would say on the basis of architecture, blindfold removed, and uh, I can't read the rest of it, but you know that these, these were Anasazi, and he's right, he's right. Um, you know, the member sites at that time, if you contrast what members is doing at 1100, to what Anasazi is doing at 1100, to what Hohokam is doing at 1100. Yeah, you know, the, the, the members in the Anasazi are pretty much the same. His, Howie's first, second graduate student, PhD student was Joe Ben Wheat, whose job I now have. Uh, I knew Joe Ben. He's no longer with, neither of those gentlemen are with us. But Joe Ben's uh, dissertation was Muggian culture prior to 81,000. He's working for Howie. So Muggian culture ends at 1000 and Joe Ben believed that. Um, to his nine day. And I pay attention to these old guys because um, I'm an old guy myself at this point. Um, that, you know, they knew what they were doing. They saw patterns and they called they called it, they called those patterns. So let's look at Anasazi. Let's switch to the North at about AD 1000, after AD 1000. Here's some, some real characteristic elements of ancestral Pueblo, Anasazi, unit Pueblos, five rooms in Akiva. And it's not really Akiva, it's a pit house, but we won't go there. Uh, that's a basic family house all over the four corners, you know, before, during, and after Chaco, right up to 1300. Then it, then it quits. Then that's when they get rid of pit houses, basically. So five rooms in Akiva, indented corrugated pottery, which is pretty wild because nobody else does that. Um, it's where you leave the coils exposed and then you come along and indent them. To, sometimes in geometric patterns, you know, it often looks like basketry. And it's be far easier to just make a plainware pot, but, you know, they wanted it to look that way. And of course, black and white pottery, which which uh, ancestral people have been doing before 1000 AD, but you know, it really comes on strong. Well, let's duke down to members. Unit Pueblos. Uh, this is one from Yellow Jacket, Joe Ben Wheat's site, with five rooms and a, a pitch structure that it pleases archaeologists to call Akiva. Well, they got those down in members too. Uh, this is Dinwiddie site that was a highway salvage thing back in the 50s or 60s or something. And they're putting their own spin on it. You know, uh, they have whatever that is, four or five rooms, and then a square subterranean, deep, deep. Uh, these kivas are deep subterranean things with a ventilator shaft, um, which is real characteristic of the kivas up north and these things, whatever they are in the members' country. You these square, deep subterranean, you know, uh, masonry line things. And I'll show you a picture of one in a minute. It has a vent shaft coming down. And so you have five rooms in the kiva. I think we, I watched one being dug. I didn't dig this. I was digging in a different part of Sage McFarland, but room block A at Sage McFarland, which is on, on the Gila River near Cliff. Um, it was, you know, starts off as, as three rooms or five rooms, excuse me, lines up with six rooms. Um, and early pottery, right? by early, I mean pottery right before 1000 AD. And again, I, these things don't happen overnight. And every time I give you a date, it's 100 years either way. But it's all the earlier members stuff, all style one, style two, or, or uh, Mangus, or the style two at one time was called Oak Creek, black and white, and none of the later stuff. So these, these are what come before the great big Pueblos, are these individual unit Pueblos. So you know, if I call this a unit Pueblo, where's the Kiva? Well, on this map, if you look, room block A is right on a road cut. So it's quite possible that the Kiva went in a road cut, uh, but also just to the uh, north of it, you see a little round circle, which is, uh, represents a, a pit house depression that we didn't excavate, and it could very well be that. 
uh, again, you, you see what you expect to see and always expecting to see, and this is 1970s, unit pueblos in the members. Uh, so they dig that. Um, but those Kiva things, those members Kiva things were there. We dug one of them, uh, pit house three, and that's what they look like. They're you know, deep, uh, masonry lined, ventilator shaft. Um, and again, this is early-ish. It's before the, the big pueblos. It's all the style, the bold face and the Oak Creek of the style one, style two. And none of the later classic members, by the way. And you know, we start looking around, and they're there. Uh, there's a couple of them at Dinwiddie. I showed you one before. A couple of them at Dinwiddie, where you clearly have four or five rooms associated with one of these rectangular deals with a, a vent shaft. Um, Wind Mountain is dug by Charlie De Peso. It's mainly a pit house site, but when you look at the at the members, the above ground architecture there, it's a whole series of scraggly two, three, five room units, each with an associated um, pit structure with a, with a vent shaft, square vent, uh, a vent shaft. They're not real deep at Wind Mountain, that's interesting, but they're definitely subterranean and they, ha they have these um, vent shafts. Um, over at, at uh, Maddox, uh, it's possible that there's one room block at Maddox. It's one of these that survived the growth of the Pueblo and you know, didn't disappear into the, the larger Pueblo. Um, that's my call. It's not what the uh, people who excavated it called it. But, and there's one that the Members Foundation dug called Bradsby in the upper members that's six rooms and you know an attached square subterranean room with a vent shaft. And I think, I think Roger Andy's writing that one up and I'm looking forward to seeing what he says about it. Oh, this was once called the Mangus phase. I just put that on here to annoy three people in the audience. It doesn't matter. Talk about the black and white pottery. Um, and members and contemporary Chaco stuff and the designs couldn't be more different. Uh, that Chaco design they called the Goji. Uh, Dottie Washburn's convinced that that comes from Mars. I mean, that just comes from nowhere in, in, in the Southwest. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are other black and white Northern pots that look more like members, much more like members with banded designs. But I'm not so interested in the designs at this point as technology. Um, when we exhibit this stuff or put it in a book, we show it to you that way, right? So you can see the designs. But in a museum, they're sitting on shelves. And so you, so you see them sideways. And you know, I walk down the charcoal black and white aisle or half aisle in our museum and look at the sides of the pots. And I walk down the members aisle look at the sides of the pots. And there's this stuff called slip slop, which I didn't make that word up. It's a technical term. Where they're putting white slip on the interior of these things and they don't care much about the exterior. They just smooth it off and a little bit of the slip goes over the top and slops. And you, know, you can see this. And it's for both the Sibylla white wares, which chocolate black and white is one of those, and the members white wares, this slip slop is diagnostic of both of those. I'm not aware of anybody else in the Southwest that does this. Uh, possibly a bit over the you know northeastern Arizona, but but it's really characteristic and it's really striking, and they know they're doing it because uh, you know it's not just an accident. They know they're doing it because sometimes they drag their fingers through it. Sometimes they'll get some of that slip on their finger and do polka dots. Um, it, I, I, we've got pots in our museum where the exterior on a chocolate one is white polka dots, and the exterior on a member's block and white white polka dots. Um, you know, this is not a coincidence. I mean, you know, these guys are paying attention to what. The other guys are doing, and it indented corrugated pottery, which is really weird. Uh, I've e casually emailed around the world for places that do not, you know, this is pre-wheel thrown pottery when you coil it up, and lots of places leave the coils exposed, or not lots of places. I mean, because it, it weakens the pot, but they you know, places that leave the coils exposed, but nobody else does this. This indented corrugated stuff, certainly anywhere in the Southwest and anywhere in Mesoamerica or anywhere in North America, nobody else does this except members in the Four Corners, the Anasazi Ancestral Pueblo. I mean, nobody else does this. This is not an independent invention. This is, you know, these are two uh, ceramic technologies that are in shared space somehow or other. I mean, I'm, I'm just telling you things that are facts. What it means is an interesting question, but we can't figure out what it means until we recognize that, yeah, you know, we can't understand members without looking at, at Ancestral Pueblo and Anasazi and quite possibly vice versa. Okay, I mentioned that Chaco and members are, are contemporary, um, almost exactly. I mean, they end about the same time. And again, that's not a coincidence, but uh, back in the day, and again, you know, I, I look back towards the, the founders of our field, I was increasing, you know, increasingly impressed. There's a thing called the Pueblo II expansion, which you don't hear about much anymore. And 
they were talking about Pueblo II in the Four Corners and specifically around Chaco. And then all around it is this penumbra, this halo of, of uh, places where people had previously been living in little pit houses and probably not paying much attention to corn and a little bit of plainware pottery. And during Pueblo II, all of a sudden they start building little stone Pueblos, making black and white pottery and planting a lot of corn. And it's all around the Four Corners. Goes out into Fremont, goes into Virgin Anasazi. I think it goes into the Northern Rio Grande um, and it goes south. And this is from a McGregor textbook, I think. And he's being political and he, he has it going into the upper helo but not into the members. But yeah, it goes into the members too. What does this mean? I, I, you know, it, at the center of it all is Chaco. That's the explosion. Polcom is diminishing at this point. It's falling back into Phoenix. Chaco is exploding. What, what's going on around it? I don't know. It may be people running to get away from Chaco. I have no idea. But the, you know, the, the pattern is there where you have this thing in the center, the Chaco that's just blowing up like a supernova. And this, all of a sudden, everybody that was happy in pit houses are building stone pueblos. And it's true in, in Fremont. It's true in, in members. Okay, let's get the sites here. Woodrow Ruin is the one of the two big ones on the Gila. It's one of these big sites everybody knew about it. Uh, they didn't know about Red Rock, um, but they, you know, we did a survey out there and found Red Rock. But um, Woodrow Ruin, everybody knew about it. The state of New Mexico bought it, was going to turn it into a state monument, but nobody did anything with it. Uh, and it was great because it was protected. The state of New Mexico bought it before the uh, commercial pot hunting of the 70s and 80s and 90s, built a chain link fence around it, and it's really well preserved. Uh, Jacob Seedig, who's now at Harvard, a uh, grad student here, and Jacob went down and worked on it um, for a few years, and it's a huge site. So in a few years, what could he do? Well, at least he got a map, and at least we know something about the site now. You know, uh, this is one of his his uh, units, um, but he put in. There was absolutely nothing visible on the surface here. Nothing. It was just flat as a pancake. And I, I think Jacob was uh, did a line of uh, auger trench uh, auger holes across the site. And one went deep here. He said, well, that's interesting. What's, what's here? Well, I'm on the left here. I'm standing on the floor of a early pit house, a deep pit house. You can't, you know, can't see it very well, but just to the right of the young lady in the white shirt on the right is the upper part of a, an adobe coping um, of a shallow pit house up above the, the earlier pit house that, by God, looks a lot like a Holocom house. Uh, and then, of course, the, the members wall. Uh, with the, with the stone there. This is this was the money pit. And it's you know best stratigraphy, uh, one of the coolest stratigraphic things I've ever seen in the members. And he, and he got a good map of the place. Um, Woodrow looks like it's a whole bunch of smaller pueblos. It's not a big mass pueblo like some of them you see in the in the members valley itself. Um, they're scattered, and in the middle of it is a uh, a structure that dominates. The site, I mean, because it sticks sticks up. All the rest of these things are things where you know you can't even can't even see them until you dig them. Um, and it's much better built. Uh, it's the thing in the lower right. And much better built. Uh, you know, right angles, which members didn't care much for right angles. They didn't care about stuff like that. Um, and it's you know, if you found it up north, this pattern of a bunch of little pueblos, maybe unit pueblos, I don't know. And a big thing in the middle. And you see those two great kivas that are like meteor craters. They're so deep. That would that would fit for a Chaco community. I'm not saying this is a Chaco community. I'm just saying that the pattern is very similar. And again, these are like facts that you know it's the pattern I'm talking about. I'm not trying to imply that you know this is a Chaco in sight. I'm just saying that they're all doing things the same way, at least over on the Gila. Okay, so during members' times, uh, they were definitely looking to the north. Let me back up. Um, you know, pre-members before 1000 AD, they're paying a lot of attention to Hoacom because Hoacom is what's going on at that point. Chaco is nothing. Uh, Hoacom starts to shrink in on itself after 1000 AD. That's right when Chaco takes off. So it's it's a one-two punch. You know, first you had Hoacom, members, that's going strong. So members pays attention to it. Hoacom starts to fade. Chaco comes online and all of a sudden they, they're all eyes are to the north and they're paying attention to the north. Okay, let's, let's look to the south. We'll get to the east eventually. Look to the south. And the big deal down south, of course, is Casas Grandes or Paquime, which you know is an amazing, probably the most amazing site outside the Phoenix Basin in the southwest. Um, an incredible city, you know, three thousand people, four thousand people, something like that. Um, that 
another big one that we all knew about, but nobody did anything with until Charlie DePeso went down there in the late 60s and, and excavated it in partnership with the National Institute of Anthropology and History of Mexico. And they found wonderful things. They found all kinds of incredible stuff from further south, uh, you know, copper. There's more copper artifacts at Casas Grandes or Paquime, um, you know, than you find at these new big imperial capitals in central Mexico and Spondyla Shell. And, they have all kinds of macaws. You had a macaws, uh, I showed you a picture of a members macaws. There are macaws and members, but I can't remember the exact number, but it's like 20 or something. Same with Chaco, it's like 20 macaws. Well, he dug, you know, about half his site and had 500 macaws, as I recall. I mean, maybe 300, but, you know, hundreds of macaws. And you can see that on uh, the Ramos polychrome, which is the characteristic pottery from, from Casas Grandes, their macaw heads poking out of macaw bins are, are uh, pens that they, they found, the pens at, at Casas Grandes. They're breeding these things in there. Okay, so Membris is just immediately north of Casas Grandes. It's 100 years earlier, right? You know, there's time between these things. Membris ends about 1150, and Pakime, what you see at Pakime today is all post 1300, but you know, it really gets going at 1250, something like that. But again, you know, let's back off and get some context here. What, what's the South going to tell us? Well, there's interesting stuff in members, uh, rare, uh, are these little stone benches. Um, there's a picture of an old guy sitting on one of these, telling a young guy what to do, or maybe the other way around, I don't know. But it, they, they seem to be, uh, to my, in my mind, um, I'll venture an interpretation, um, they're a symbol of you know importance. You're an important guy, you get to put your butt on, on one of these stone um, benches. Um, they found only found one, a galaz, and then they're they're in some on some member spots. And probably a lot of them are made out of wood because I've seen some made out of wood that would have deteriorated. But this is you know, this is an element of members culture. Well, they have them at Pocky made too, and again, no place else. You know, you don't see these up north. You don't see these in Hohokam. You don't see these over in the Hornada. See these stone benches, um, stools, whatever you want to call them. Uh, there are about thirty of them down there. And they're made out of different materials, but uh, most of them are made out of red rock serpentine rickolite. It's very specific. Uh, in fact, it's a stone that was commercially quarried uh, in recent times as uh, architectural, um, for architectural purposes, uh, for facings and stuff like that. So the, the red rock serpentine rickolite that's supplying the raw materials for these stools, which are being made at Pocky Main, there's all kinds of you know, half finished stools and debris and all that stuff, is coming from right across from the Red Rock site, which is the biggest member site anywhere, all right? But again, you know, 100 years difference. Uh, it's just, uh, the quarries are just up the river a little ways, a little ways from a great big slaughter site, which would be contemporary with, with Pocky Um, almost exactly contemporary with Pocky May. And at the, that slaughter site, it's interesting because you get subfloor burials, which I'll talk about in a minute, and that are very members a way of getting rid of your bodies with, Chihuahua, you know, Casas Grandes po uh, polychromes in a, in a Salado site. It, it's just really interesting. Um, another oddity, uh, you know, I like, I like weird things that it, I think tell us a lot. Again, and it's patterns. I don't, you know, I'm not implying what this means. These are just patterns. But horned serpents, the earliest horned serpents that I know in the Southwest are on these members bowls. Um, and these are two different bowls, two different sites, same scene where some guy in a horned serpent rig is removing the head of somebody else. Um, this is not cheerful stuff, all right? Uh, not cheerful stuff. Horned serpents are all over uh, Casas Grandes, you know, Pakime pottery, but they also, at, at Pakime itself, they did an effigy mound of a horned serpent. Who does effigy mounds outside the Ohio Valley? An effigy mound of a horned serpent that's a football field long. I mean, these guys are big into horned serpents and, you know, eventually horned serpents get all up and down the Rio Grande. It's not like they're only at these two places. That's not true. They're all up and down the Rio Grande, but later. <laughs> you know, early on, they're only in members, I think. And, and then, you know, there's sort of a Casas Grandes thing that, you know, horned serpents. Okay, the real kicker for me, you know, I got to kick it into gear here, are subfloor burials. Uh, you dig a hole in the corner of your room. Uh, you fold up Aunt Gertrude or you know, you're, you're on or dead, uh, place them in that hole, fill it back in, put a pot, maybe not over their head. And these are not real burials. These are both um, schematics from the uh, one on the left is actually, I think from Jesse Walter Fuchs. Um, and then seal over that hole, uh, replaster, and you go and live in the room. In some rooms, especially in the Members Valley, 
uh, some rooms you wind up with like 20 people buried under the floor. And I suspect they're not living in those rooms anymore. They're, they're burial rooms. But the, the idea of putting somebody under the floor and then sealing them and having the room be a, a functioning room, they only do that in Membris and they only do that at Pakime and some other Casas Grande sites. And it's the only places they do that in the Southwest. And you know you have to go to Maya country before you find anything like this heading south. Elsewhere in the Southwest, they put people in middens, they put people in cemeteries, they do, for post Chaco times, they will put people in a room, intramural, but they're putting a person in the room, on the floor with all kinds of stuff, and then they seal the room up. You know, they're not putting them under the floor and, and uh, um, plastering it over. And I think that, that's, they're different, different forms of burial. So at Membris, say here's Swartz Ruin, which is the most completely excavated member site, over a thousand burials. And uh, I need to move my talking head feature here. Oh, almost 90% of them are subfloor burials. And some of these, the, they're the dots in this map. And some of those are actually in pit houses, but, but you know, by, yes, uh, it's subfloor burials. That's what they do. Um, another 10% of them are basically subfloor burials out in the plaza where they dig a hole in the plaza, they put somebody in it, then they plaster over it. And then I don't know if they're dancing on top of them or not, but, but you know, the plaza continues to be used. And then there's some other odds and ends, including a few cremations. Um, okay, at Pakime, and you don't, need to read this thing on the left, it's from DePesa's report, uh, different different kinds of uh, sub four burials. But the same thing's true that, that, excuse me, I have to plug in my computer because I'm running low on energy. Um, yeah, over 60% of the, the burials at Pakime were sub floor, another 30% were sub floor burials in the plaza. I mean, the same thing, but just in the plaza area, not just on the hillside someplace. I mean, they're in the, in the, in the, the city. And you know a handful of other odds and ends. They're the only people that do this, Membris and Pakime, and it's very particular. And even though they're 100 years apart, this to me is a smoking gun. The real smoking gun is DNA, and I can't really talk about that, but I'm confident in what I'm saying. Let's put it that way. Here's a map that was put together by Coalescent Communities Database. It's a it's older version of the maps that are going around these days. Where you know 1200, 1250, there's just not a lot of people in the Casas Grandes area. In fact, they got one dot there. The dots represent concentrations of population. One dot at Pakime. Well, Pakime wasn't there at 1200, 1250. Um, there were certainly people in the valley, but the city didn't exist at that point. Um, and, you know, there'd be more, really more dots than you can see there. There were people in the in the Casas Grandes Valley. The Casas Grandes is a, great, a lovely river that's running out of Sierra Madres, and it's why Casas Grandes is there. You know, it's a beautiful agricultural area. So there were people there, but there just weren't many, at least as far as in my opinion, there weren't many, and and Charlie De Peso went looking for what was there before Casas, before Pocky May, and Mike Whalen and and Paul Menes went looking, and not coming up with a lot. It's not that there were no people there. Of course, there were people there, but not many. Then you look at 1350 to 1400 when when Pocky May is really a going concern, and there's all kinds of people down there, lots of people. And actually, if you believe De Peso's surveys, which these guys apparently didn't, this is one of the most densely occupied areas in the Southwest at this time. So where did these guys come from? Well, with members, that all ends about 11.30, 11.50, and they actually leave their villages. And you got, I don't know, five, six, 7,000 members people. For my work, you know, it's 6,000. Uh, they got to go somewhere. Um, down in Casas Grandes at its peak, you know, you're talking many tens of thousands of people in the region. I'm talking about at Pakime itself, I'm talking about the whole region, and same with members, the whole region. Um, so, you know, it's not like everybody down there is going to be from members, uh, I think Pakime was like Cahokia or centuries earlier, like Teotihuacan, where you have a city that gets started and it sucks in the countryside, sucks in people from all different directions. That's one reason why Pakime is so cosmopolitan. There's stuff from everywhere there and probably people from everywhere there that get sucked into that, that development. Um, so yeah, members isn't gonna be all of, of the Casas Grandes based population. And you know, there, again, there's local people for sure, and there's, I think there's people probably from West Mexico and God knows where else. Um, but yeah, you know, it'd be a convenient way to get rid of 6,000 members. People is just shift them down to Pakime, with the evidence of the subfloor burials. I, yeah, and the other stuff I can't talk about. Um, I think that's what happened. The, the members is a substantial part of what made Pakime Pakime. So that's moving. That's context, you know, to the south, but also in time. Except time's a problem because there's a hundred years between the two. They leave members 1130, 1150. Pocky may get started at 1250 and really hits 
1300. But there is an intervening uh, archaeology called Black Mountain Phase um, that dreadfully under-researched. Okay, this is the Black Mountain type site. And it's another one of these great big sites everybody knew about. Nobody did anything with it. It's huge, um, but it's messed up, seriously messed up. It's very near Deming and everybody from Deming went out there and pot hunted. And then somebody guy took a road grader and went over it and people thought the site wasn't there anymore. But you know, again, you know, we knew it was there, but nobody had done anything with it. And maybe maybe because it's too big and scary. But uh, Katie Putsavage, who uh, was a PhD student here at CU, went down there for a few years, and she did the same thing that Jacob did up at Woodrow, and, you know, another big site that everybody knew about. Nobody did anyone. Anyway. Got a good map. Uh, most of the Black Mountain stuff is on the left there, which would be west, north is to the top, and then there's a, and it probably extends further to the east underneath. That red thing to the east is the Salado Pueblo, uh, post Black Mountain, uh, contemporary with, with uh, exactly contemporary with Casas Grandes. Um, again, you know, just poked a few holes here and there, but the site was there. A uh, guy took a road grader to it, but he didn't eliminate it. He just sort of smoothed it over the top. Not much to look at, and that's one reason why people haven't done a lot of Black Mountain archaeology is that you know sites aren't. You know, Ansel Adams never took a picture of Black Mountain site. Um, and the pottery is not much to look at. Uh, when they leave members, they turn their back on that that uh, flashy pottery and all the ideological content, I think. You know, it didn't work out for them. And this actually, that jibes with some stuff I've heard from Pueblo people. It didn't work out for them. They turn their back on that. And for the Black Mountain phase, they don't make much of their own pottery. They're getting their own, you know, pottery from everywhere around. And there's not much decorated pottery at all. Uh, most of the bowls are this black smudged polished interior bowls that are some of the really nice ones are almost like mirrors it's like you look at them and you go you see your eyes it's like they're anti-design in members they put all this effort in the interior bowls and then slip slop on the outside and black mountain they you know it's like an anti-design like they don't do that anymore whatever that meant then you have this explosion after black mountain and causes kind of well this figurative art again but uh, this time it's well it's two-dimensional on the on the, in paint but it's also three-dimensional and all these molded modeled um, um if you call it hooded jars, these effigy jars, and which of which there are a lot down there. So it's a re resurgence of the figurative stuff, but in, you know, again, different time, different place, different culture, basically. But some of the same people, probably. So where did, you know, you had this member stuff that's that's very, you know, famous for being figurative, and Casas Grandes, which in its own way is famous for being figurative. Is it possible that, that the member stuff, that that I'll call it an artistic tradition, but that's not how it functioned in the past, but that that tradition um, got transferred to other media. You know, they don't do it on the pots anymore, but they store it somewhere. And this is where Harnada comes in. Um, the Three Rivers Petroglyph site, uh, and in Harnada, there's a bunch, I could go on forever on this, there's a bunch of sites that have a lot of members pottery over there and over the white sands and places like that, and in the Harnada de Marto itself. Um, the Three Rivers is famous, it's, you know, well outside the normal members area for having members rock art. Um, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of elements of members looking figures. Um, it's you know almost impossible to date rock art, but the thought of the rock art people, I'm not a rock art person, is that this is members and post members, that this comes after members as well. And they, they continue making members looking images in rock art. And maybe that's like a reservoir of these images that are still hot. You know, they're ideologically charged, but you park them in a rock art park, <laughs> you know, way over in the boonies. Um, like a lot of Pueblo ceremonial stuff, you know, it, it's dangerous to have it around. So you put it in a cave or you put it way deep in the building or something like that. You park it and you bring it out when you need it. Maybe they needed it when they got the Casas Grandes, you got the Pocky May in, in, you know, different forms. I mean, none of this stuff is staying static. So yeah, it may go bing, bang, boom. Uh, certainly geographically it works because the, the Black Mountain sites, members are moving out in the desert south towards, towards Pakime and they wander around the desert for a hundred years or less and join all the other people that are, that are building Pakime and Casas Gondes. And I think are you know, a major part of, of that because of the burial patterns. I mean, you know, they're not an insignificant minority, they're a major part of it. So, for pre-members, I think they're hillbilly Holocom. And they're paying a lot of attention to Holocom. A lot of the stuff they do looks like Holocom, only not quite. You know, it's got their own spin on it. Uh, at 1000 AD, um, Holocom's going down, Chaco's going up. 
members pays a lot of attention to what's going on to the north and a lot of stuff they're doing looks like stuff to the north again with their local spin on it so it's sort of low church chaco the post members you know there's the collapse chaco reor completely reorganizes moves to the north you know something happens members just gives up they leave their their villages they turn their back on their their artistic traditions at least in in some media media and they change clothes you know they quit building stone pueblos build adobe pueblos i mean you know they they rethink things and they wander up down south where i think they're working class heroes i don't think they're the elites down there i don't think they're the rulers but they're the guys that are if they're not do, they're doing the dying and the burying let's put it that way uh or at least i convinced everybody that that's the way to bury people and i think that's it um yeah sorry if i went a little long there but uh i get excited about this stuff so i'll turn it back over to bill i guess okay well thanks steve that was great as always entertaining educational i heard a lot of things i hadn't heard before really like it don't believe them <laughs> well i didn't say that um got a few questions for you um first of all chris asked regarding the camelot great house was there a great house on the tularosa river at present-day cruiseville yes it's called aragon it was right across from old Fort Tularosa. Oh no, okay. There's two Tularosas. The one that I'm thinking of the Tularosa River of on the west. Yeah. And that's I think that's where Cruiseville is. Yeah. But yeah, there was uh, one that's been destroyed, but uh, there are good pictures of it. It had a circular masonry, great kiva, and it was multi-story with this really nice masonry up on a, on a hill, which is typical great house stuff and the descriptions this is from Fuchs I think the descriptions sure make it sound like a great house and for those of us that are inclined to see great houses like me and Steve LeBlanc uh, we both independently saw that one in, uh, in the literature and said oh that's one of them so hopefully that's the one he's asking about but I don't think it exists anymore I think it's gone okay so Barb asked at the, the Woodrow ruin how did they know to excavate there <clears throat> Surface pottery or petroglyphs? Um, Woodrow. What happened to Woodrow? Uh, Woodrow, you can tell that there's architecture all over the place. It's just hard to make sense out of it. That polygon around there uh, that surrounds the site, that's the eight foot chain link fence that the Museum of New Mexico built around it based on. Stu Peckham's map. I, I don't know if you know Stu Peckham, but he's another one of the older guys that really knew what he was looking at. And he went out and mapped the thing as best he could and said, this is the area. And one of the local avocationalists said, well, they missed the they missed the ball court. The ball court's outside the fence. Um, but uh, yeah, you can see walls and that's, that's what is showing there. Walls are visible from the surface. And then when Jacob dug this thing, you couldn't see anything. So there's probably way more architecture that's out there. I mean, this is a, in an area that was just flat and you know no vegetation or anything. You found this one by by doing an auger lines. He did a bunch of auger lines back and forth across the thing, looking for trying to figure out how many pit houses were there, or how extensive the pit house occupation was, and came across this. So some of it's visible from the surface, um, and you know we knew about it because Stu Peckham had turned it into a state monument, and well. It never turned into state money, but the state of New Mexico bought it and then gave it to the Museum of New Mexico um, years ago, you know, before I started working down there. So how did we find that? Well, <laughs> Peckham told us about it. Okay, got a question from Ted regarding architecture. What is the significance of T-shaped doorways? Why do our uh, separate question? Why do archaeologists refer to sites in terms of corporate kivas, burials, etc.? Well, T-shaped, I'm trying to give you something pretty to look at. This, it's not pretty, but um, T-shaped doors is a whole other lecture. Um, T-shaped doors started Chaco in the great houses and seem to be limited to great houses. And then when the capital moves north from Chaco to Aztec, it's full of T-shaped doors uh, and they're exterior doors. They're almost always exterior doors. So you see, that's what you'd see when you come up to the building and it identify you as a T-shaped door guy, whatever that means. Uh, when when they move to Aztec, they get democratized, and you see T-shaped doors all over Mesa Verde. Everybody has T-shaped doors. And then after 1300, there are no more T-shaped doors in the Pueblo area. You know, there's reports of one here and one there. Uh, who cares? But where they reappear is all over Chihuahua, uh, all over Casas Grande, Pachyme is just all kinds of T, big T doors. I call them mega T's. 
you know, uh, in the exterior and in smaller T doors on the interiors. We got to go down and look at, at cliff dwellings in the Sierra Madres last year. Uh, and I wanted to see them because they all have T doors and I'd seen pictures, but I, you know, I wanted to see myself. And so, you know, you got these cliff dwellings up there that have these big T doors that are just obvious when you walk up to them. And so it's, it's, it's telling whoever comes up to the place that the people that live there are part of the T door group, which, you know, if you're part of the T door group, I suppose that means you get a meal out of the deal. And if you're not part of the T door group, maybe you tiptoe around the canyon and go someplace else. But it's, it's definitely an identity thing and part of architecture. That's what I say. I, I love doors. I mean, doors are telling you a lot about who's in the building. Uh, the second part of the question, why do archaeologists use those words? I have no idea. <laughs> Because we, we, we like to sound esoteric. Uh, okay. Um, Larry has a question. Dr. Luxon, do you have any theories why the Chaco expansion occurred? Is it environmental or other reasons? Certainly environmental. Um, you know, Chaco uh, got lucky. You know, it's a chicken and the egg thing. It got lucky. And when Chaco was going, for most of the time when Chaco was going, it rained, which means that you know, the government's doing its job. It's raining. That's, that's their job. And, and it was also peaceful, um, in part because it was raining, I'm sure, but also because there's a central government that made sure it stayed peaceful, sometimes by employing violence against folks they didn't like. Um, I can't help but think that the fact that Hoacom is, was the big deal, that was the big deal in the Southwest up to, up to about 1000 AD. Um, you know, nothing else is going on that was really all that interesting. Then Holocom starts to fall apart and the ball court systems falls apart before 1100 and you know they, they physically retract back in the Phoenix Basin or, or the, the elements that identify Holocom as a, um, an entity retract into the Phoenix Basin. You know, and while that's happening, while Holocom's shrinking, Chaco explodes and it just goes out in all directions. And again, it's, you know, they were fortunate that it was good weather, you know, it was wet, which helped. Um, but it's also being driven by politics. I mean, what we would call politics. I mean, it's all wrapped up with politics and ritual and all that stuff is a bundle back in the day, I'm sure. Um, we'll never know. But yeah, it's being driven by folks that um, are holding power and enjoying it. I mean, they're living in nice houses and everybody else is living in a house. And then they're living in stuff that anywhere else would be called a palace. And they have all this stuff and they're drinking cacao and, you know, whatever. They're having a good time. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's certainly it was a favorable, you know, it was favorable environmental conditions, very favorable environmental conditions um, that allowed them to feed a lot of mouths and build those big houses and do what they did. But why they chose to do what they did was because they were people making political choices, I think. Okay, Renata asks, what about the DNA analysis that links the members to the Taramara and the Sierra Madre? Yeah, um, I'm not sure it links them to the Tarahumara. It links them to uh, archaeological, if, it were th if we're thinking of the same studies, uh, to archaeological uh, bodies in, this, in the Sierra Madres, the, the Cliff House people. The, the Tarahumara or the Rummery, um, last time I checked, I mean, these things change. Uh, they, they say, I don't, I don't know. I actually know a couple of those guys, um, but you know, you couldn't speak for all of them, but they, they profess, the official position was they profess to not have been the descendants of uh, whatever Casas Grandes was. You know, they have bad stories about Casas Grandes and Pachyman. And I think that the, the dentition and the, and the DNA is probably bearing that out as well. So yeah, there, there's DNA stuff that, you know, there's DNA from member sites that go, comes from West Mexico. Right, um, but it, it cer certainly links, and this is early stuff. I mean, there's more coming down the pipe. It's just gonna, you know, just hammer this home, but it's not published. The, the DNA, yeah, there are links between members and, and Casas County's populations. And I can't really say more than that. Okay, but I just scrolled down and saw a response from Chris who asked about the uh, Cruzville and the uh, Tularosa Great House. And she says, yes, above reserve. Yeah, yeah, we're talking about the same thing. Okay, here's a uh, Marilyn ask, where is Black Mountain in the US or in Mexico? It's about uh, 10, 12 miles northwest of Deming. So it's, you can see Mexico from there, but um, it's in the US. 
if you're willing to say the Deming's in the U.S. <laughs> okay. Uh, I like Deming. Here's a good and simple question from Bruce. What came next after Casas Grandes? Well, that's a whole other lecture I'd love to give. Um, uh, how to... Culiacan. <laughs> Culiacan in, in Sinaloa. Um, uh, short, very short version. Uh, Alexander von Humboldt you know, is this amazing Renaissance man, last of the great Enlightenment figures, who uh, is a Prussian. He travels through Mexico and uh, uh, he's, he's a geographer. I mean, he's a you know, Renaissance man, but he's a geographer. Travels to Mexico, spends some time in Mexico City, and he's working with the archives of the Royal Institute of Mines in 1800, or 1799. Um, and he's got, you know, he's say, oh, he's already famous. He's got every, I'm sure everybody that was anybody in Mexico City, which is a very sophisticated place at that point. They had all kinds of universities, and you know, they they made Philadelphia look like nothing at that point. Um, leaning over his shoulder, and he's working with these old maps, which included collections of pre-Columbian maps and all the early early explorers maps. And he compiles a map of maps of everywhere he goes. But he, he, he publishes a map of the Southwest. He never got to the Southwest. He never got up there. He never got to New Mexico. It didn't exist. Well, yeah, it did. It did. But it's, it's based on these maps from Mexico City. And he shows three, three areas. I mean, it's a good map. The, the latitudes are perfect and the longitude is not so good. But, but you know, it's, it's a good map. And it's, again, it's a compilation of stuff from the archives and what people are telling them, I think this represents probably the consensus of Mexican scholarship, Spanish scholarship, actually, at that point, this is before the revolution um, in Mexico City. Um, <clears throat> he talks about three ancient places in the Southwest. He's got all the geography and everything else, but he, the first home of the Aztecs is south of the San Juan River and east of the Colorado. And, you know, that could be Chaco. They knew about Chaco. They don't label it as that. The second home of the Aztecs is Casa Grande, near, you know, near south of Phoenix. And then the third home of the Aztecs is Casas Grandes, is Paquime. And these are unequivocal, the last two. And, and the, the, what it says on the map is the third home of the Aztecs from which they went through the Tarahumara country to Culiacan. <laughs> and if you see where Culiacan is, it's due south. It's, it's on the meridian. And Culiacan is the northwesternmost city that the Spanish recognize as a city when Guzman is actually coming up the coast. Uh, he's a real thug with his boys, and they're burning up everything and taking slaves. And he's headed for the Southwest, he never makes it. He, he was the first in Trotta, he just didn't, he didn't make it past Culiacan. Um, but that's the last place that they, uh, uh, Spanish recognized as civilization. And, uh, um, oh, what's the name of the guy that worked down there for so long? Another one of the old guys, who's unfortunately, his name's slipping my mind right now, who worked in West Mexico, said that Culiacan really- Kelly. Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, that there was there was something there before 1450, but Culiacan really takes off. Uh, Culiacan Viejo, uh, Culi, where Culiacan is now, the Spanish moved it upstream a little bit. But Culiacan Viejo really takes off at 1450, which is right when Casas Grandes ends. Okay, there's a question for Marilyn. Nope, keep getting more questions. I could have keep scrolling back up. Are you aware of Creekside Village in Tularosa? Dave Greenwell is working there from the Jornada. Research Institute. Yeah, I'm aware of it. I've heard about it at conferences. I haven't had a chance to visit it. I mean, it sounds really interesting. I don't, is there a lot of members pottery there? That would be interesting. No idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm aware of it. It's earlier. It's it's Hornada. Well, there's. Don't get me started on Hornada. I, I gave a paper once at a Hornada conference where I said Hornada is what members did in the winter. They didn't like it. <laughs> Okay, but I think Dave says it's pre-members. Pre-members? Okay. Okay. Joyce asks, are there any indications that the rock art site, I think that means Three Rivers, may have been a pilgrimage site? Um, it's kind of isolated. Um, I don't know the archaeology real well around there. There are some large, you know, it's north of Alamogordo, and there's, you know, big sites near Alamogordo, and there's a big one that... Uh, uh, Eugene McClooney dug that's a little close to that that had lots of members pottery. Um, but the feeling you get when you go out there today is it's isolated and yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I, I, it, this notion of them sort of parking that ideology out there on rocks um, may sound silly. I kind of like it. I mean, it's like you put it up there and 
it's way far away from the main mainstream members and from the Black Mountain stuff. So it's not like a whole lot of people are going to be seeing it. So yeah, you know, you'd probably go there for a pilgrimage or you go go there to remember what this symbol means or what that symbol means. Something yeah, we, this is out, out of my territory, but something like that. Yeah, here's a note from Linda says that this lecture, oh, skipped up again. Lecture is not about the meaning of pictures, but another thing that happens around 900 to 1000 is the shrinking of the Maya. Um, I've heard theories of a relationship creating cultural changes. Did this possible diaspora show up in the Hokam? In the Hokam? Uh, there are Pat Gilman uh, and uh, Mark Thompson before her, they are together actually working together, uh, have made some really interesting arguments, not arguments, some really interesting interpretations where they look at members pottery and relate it to Maya um, mythology, uh, the Popol Vuh specifically, uh, which of course is much later, but it's recording old, presumably recording old Maya stories. Um, Maya may be very much involved in this stuff. Uh, it's one possible source for the macaws, uh, uh, certainly a possible source for the cacao that, that Patty Crown has found at, at Chaco. In, in other places. Um, there are other places in Mexico and West Mexico and Mike Mathiewicz thinks you can get both those things and you know so maybe the connections are going to West Mexico but people archaeologists have made links between members and Maya. I'm not aware and I'm not the right guy to ask you got people you know on the zoom who could answer this for Hoacom I'm not aware of people looking at Maya for Hoacom but um, somebody might jump in and say oh yes. Well, I got a message. Alan Dart is typing an answer right now. All right. Al, do you want to speak? No, I, I don't know of any studies to that question. In but For sure, there's been talk of members in, in Maya. Um, it's not, I wouldn't say that it's universally accepted, but it's certainly interesting. It's really, really good. Uh, uh, track down uh, Pat Gelman's stuff. It's really interesting. Question from Christopher, Dr. Lexon, was there continuity of beliefs, traditions from Chaco through to Pacame through members? No idea. Um, I'm looking more, you know, the, the you know, like cosmology and traditions and beliefs are, are things that it's amazing how archeologists are so glib talking about that stuff because we can't possibly know. Um, you know, we can look at material remains and say, oh, this looks like that. So maybe it's the same thing. Or look at something in members where all of a sudden they quit painting and say, well, something happened. You know, they, they rejected that. But I don't know what it meant to start with. And I don't know why they rejected it or what they, what they came up with later. Um, there's continuities um, like T doors and other architectural features uh, that go from Chaco and jump over members and land at Pocky May. Um, I think it's related to political power, but, um, you know, I talk about great houses, not necessarily Chaco great houses, but things that look like great houses, local limitations, you know, at least on the Gila in member sites. And, you know, that, that sort of stuff, you know, is that a continuity or is it just local people saying, well, you know, that seems to be working well for them up North. We'll try one down here. They, the, the, the Stuff that I would link would go from Chaco to Pocky May and not pay much attention, you know, go it'd go right over um, uh, members. Not that, you know, members was paying a lot of attention to Chaco and vice versa, but I don't think they were part of this power play that I think structured a lot of Southwestern free history. Okay, Gerald asks, is it true as I've heard that members people voluntarily lived with the whole com? Also, other move-ins occurred. I have no idea. I'm not sure where that's coming from. I wouldn't doubt it for a second, because yeah, I think, like like I said, you know, the, the one of the biggest Holocom ball courts is just a hop, skip, and a jump from the biggest member site. I mean, these guys are probably in each other's pockets all the time. Um, the the cremations that you find in member sites. Um, this is not me. I, I don't think it's Daryl Creel. Maybe it's Daryl. I mean, Daryl. Daryl is willing to take chances like this. And people suggested that, that might be Hoakam people who died in a member site and were treated as Hoakam, you know, with a cremation as opposed to the subfloor burials. 
of it, you know, it's really hard to tell from cremated bone. It's hard to tell anything, you know, aside from maybe you can tell how old they were or whatever. Um, but, you know, forget about DNA or forget about, you know, any genetic stuff. Okay, Barb broth got a question for you. Steve, why oh, okay. if Chaco <laughs> was influenced Membrus, influencing Membrus, are there no Chaco artifacts in Membrus? Doesn't that speak to the idea that Membrus was purposely ignoring Chaco? No. I mean, I'll go back to architecture. I mean, stuff moves, but Membrus didn't need Chaco pottery, and, and Chaco evidently didn't want Membrus pottery, but Membrus people were living in unit pueblos. Um, some of them, at least, are living in unit pueblos, which is very much a northern form. Before, you know, long before members, long before Chaco, five rooms in a, in a pit structure is how people lived up north. It's not how they lived down south. Um, they were living in, well, in bar business, um, you know, in things that vaguely kind of look like uh, Hoacom courtyard groups. I mean, you could, they, they aren't nice and easy to define like Hoacom courtyard groups, but clusters of, of pit structures that, you know, this is interesting because you know they, they might not all be contemporary or whatever. Um, I'm not sure what a Chaco artifact would be. Uh, you know, most of the most of the stuff that you find at Chaco was made elsewhere, for starters. Um, you know, Chaco black and white. Again, with that that uh, Dottie Washburn makes this point. That, you know, that particular Degoji design stuff that that comes out of nowhere. And I'm not familiar. And it does show up on other pottery types in the in the four corners. I'm not aware of any whole, uh, members piece that uses that kind of design uh, layout. Um, yeah, it didn't fit with what what you know members believed. I don't think that Chaco, you know, I don't think Chaco bought into whatever members was because they, you know, they didn't have that pottery. Um, I, this is telling stories out of court here, but I've talked to some Pueblo people lately because uh, members is front and center in Nagpur these days that at least some of the Pueblo people that I've talked to say that they know about Membrus and it wasn't good and they don't know quite what to do with it. They, you know, stuff happened down there that they weren't cheerful about. But they say the same thing about Chaco. That stuff happened out there that, you know, they, they, they don't know quite how to process that these days. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, this is when I, you know, when I talk about this stuff, and I've been talking about this stuff for years, the people working in the Membrus area seem to think that I'm saying that Chaco, I, I'm not talking about Chaco swamping or Anasazi swamping. That was Howery's term years ago, but he recognized a pattern. The point, my point is that he saw a pattern, it's a real pattern, that there's a lot of stuff in members that looks like stuff from the North. You got to recognize the pattern and then try to decide what it'll do. I mean, some of these things might've gone from South to North, like corrugated pottery and then corrugated pottery might be earlier in members than it is up North. I don't know, but you can't even ask those questions, you know, unless you recognize that um, the two are, there was hanky panky going on between the two. Okay. That's, uh, that's, that's been recorded. That's good to know. So Dave asked, did uh, De Peso's work offer any observations about these connections that maybe haven't received the attention they deserve? Um, De Peso spent a lot of time linking Pocky May to Chaco. That's when I first got to thinking about this because I was working at Chaco and, you know, like anybody else in the Southwest, I had turf issues. Uh, De Peso said that Chaco was Casas Grande's outlier, basically, and no, it's not. You know, it's when, when Bill and I are working out there, and you get you know possessive about these things. Um, but he he wrote uh, many pages, several pages, especially in architecture, um, drawing parallels between the two. And I wrote something where I, I went point by point and said this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. But these three things, <laughs> you know, I can't explain those. There are three, three, you know, three very uh, several very interesting things that the peso called out, and I discovered some more. They really are only at those two sites and you know you can't wish them away. So what does that mean? Again, it's, it's recognizing a pattern and then trying to figure, you know, I'm not saying what it means, but um, then, try, then trying to figure out what it means. But you got to recognize the pattern first. I have completely taught myself out of what was the original question. That, Did the peso offer any observations oh, about connections that haven't received the attention they deserve? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Go. He's another one of these old guys that that I pay attention to. You know, he had his interesting issues. I mean, he had some agendas, not, not him personally, but his archaeology had, is driven by some agendas that were interesting. But but he was a very smart guy who knew a lot, had traveled all over the place, had seen stuff, and he's it's worth reading what he wrote. 
Uh, Glenn asked, do you think the early members could have been HOCOM that split off and moved east? It'd be interesting. Uh, I don't, I don't, yeah, I wouldn't say that, but you know, that's the kind of question you can ask once you realize that, you know, there's a connection between the two. That's a good question. You could research it. I, I can't think of any sort of smoking gun stuff that would, would support that. Um, but I think they're all part of one larger world. I mean, you know, they're well aware of each other and members was mimicking some of Hohokam. And who knows, maybe Hohokam is mimicking some of members. I don't know. I mean, it could go both ways. Okay, here's a, a note from Marilyn who says the Kiva and irrigation system are AD 600 to 800 at Creekside. The additional Kivas are in the area. Yeah, cool. I, I remember, yeah, there is some early irrigation. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to go visit that place. And, you, and if there's, I said there's not canal irrigation up north, but there is um, in very limited applications. You see a little, you know, canal irrigation supposedly. There's canals at Chaco. I don't know what was flowing in them, but also at Aztec Ruins, there were the early accounts um, reported ancient irrigation ditches. What's interesting is when when uh, the whip comes down and things fall apart and it quits raining, there's still nice streams that didn't dry up up there and they chose not to use irrigation. They must have known about it. I mean, you know, they, they were not ignorant of Hocom either. They chose not to use irrigation uh, and moved to the Rio Grande where they used irrigation in canals. Um, but they, you know, instead of doing that, they left. And I think that's probably, again, as much a political thing as an environmental thing that they just chucked it in. But they, every time I say, you know, there's nothing up there that's like that. Well, yeah, there's a couple of things up there that's like that, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to make a point. Yeah, here's either a request or an order from CJ saying, hey, don't pick on Deming. Hey, I like Deming. Uh, for a long time, I didn't like Deming because I did, like I said, I, I worked down there for years. And anytime my truck would blow up, it would be somewhere near Deming. And so I'd spend a lot of time in the garage at Deming waiting for parts to come in from Las Cruces. And uh, I got to like the place more when we were living there doing the Black Mountain project. Um, yeah, you know, it, I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> okay. And we'll pick on Deming. Okay. And uh, here's the last question we have here from Peter. Any thoughts on the theory that the plume serpent resembles the larvae of the moth that pollinates the Datura plant? Um, there was a members exhibit out at the LA County Museum of Art that I didn't get to see. Uh, it kind of came and went quickly and it was under my radar anyway, but I think that was one of the themes of that exhibit, unless I'm wrong. Uh, I believe there's a catalog and right now I can't even remember who organized it or, but it was LA County Museum of Art. And I may be telling you nonsense here, but I think that was one of the themes that, that uh, you know, a lot of it was about um, psychotropic drugs and the animals that interacted with them and that kind of stuff. I don't have an opinion. I just, you know, I think that's out there. And if you can track down that catalog, you might learn something. Okay, well, it's um, past 830 and I think we wrap it up, but uh, thanks again, Steve. This has been great. Also, uh, I'll Excuse give me, you the, Bill, before you do that, there, there were some questions and comments in the chat. Uh, Steve, do you have a little more time? Yeah, I guess. I'm an old guy. I go to bed this about, that, about now. Maybe we can get you when you're sleepy then. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do those, Al, or you want me to? Yeah, I'll take a look at them. Hang on a sec. Scroll up a long way. There's a lot of comments in the chat here. Oh, by the way, my links are in the chat near the beginning of the chat. If anybody wants to look up, you know, old Pueblo links. Okay, let's see. Screen share working. Yeah, Eileen Kingsley has a few comments. Um, tell you what, I, I will provide Steve with this chat because some of these are kind of long. But one of Eileen's comments was about the term Anasazi and the different interpretations of that term by uh, Pueblo Indians and Navajo and Mescalero. 
which is a pretty interesting comment. They, they have different interpretations of what that term actually means. Uh, if I can comment on that, it's, you know, it's an archaeology term. Uh, some archaeologists asked the local Navajos, who are these guys? And they said something that sounded vaguely like Anasazi. I mean, I've heard it said in Navajo and it doesn't sound like, you know, it's not Anasazi. <laughs> but we adopted it. We took it like we do a lot of stuff and, and use it as an archaeology term. Um, I'd be real curious, you know, it, please forward that, Al. I mean, I'd be really curious to see what other people think about it, but it, it's uh, not a term that the Pueblos are fond of. I know that. Right. Okay, here's one from Stephen. said, when did Great Kivas start in the Southwest and why did it start? What's a Great Kiva? I mean, in, in a town, you'll have, you know, um, often have one building in the middle of the town, it's bigger. On the left is Pit House Village. You see there's a Northern cluster and a Southern cluster and that's pretty common in members with a plaza, you know, or an open area in between and off on one side of the plaza is this, that big, they call it a great Kiva. The term Kiva is, is something that archeologists shouldn't use anymore. I mean, we don't know those things are anything like a modern Kiva, but you call them that and everybody believes it. Um, that pattern of having a whole bunch of scattered pit houses with one big one in the middle. I saw it, uh, um, it's a site that uh, I think wound up being called Santa Cruz Bend, a, an early ag site in Tucson that uh, they were doing something on, on the interstate, you know, readjusting an exit or an entry, uh, whatever, and dug this site that, that uh, was like a thousand BC or something like that, that had a bunch of small, uh, circular pit houses in the middle of it was a large circular structure. Yeah, that was Santa house. Cruz Bend. Santa Cruz Bend, yes, thank you. It had a different name, it was like Vaca Muerto or something like that. But, That's what it used uh, to be called, yes. <laughs> but, you know, that, that pattern of having one big community house, uh, if you want to call it that, in the middle of a uh, town or a, a village um, goes way back. It goes way back. I saw it up on uh, Black Mesa, back when they were doing the Black Mesa project. Um, they were digging an archaic period site that had structures and they had all these archaic, you know, shallow pit houses in the middle of it was one, one big one. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it starts really early and it continues right on through. I mean, if you're looking for where modern Rio Grande Key was at least, and probably Hopi Key was, if you want to trace their history, I would look at those structures, not at the little round rooms that are part of unit pueblos and things like that. Those aren't kivas. I, I do not believe those are kivas in any useful sense of that term. But if you know you want something where there's one or two of them for for village, that's what you see at, in the Rio Grande. There are one or two per plaza, and that's what happens all you know all the way back to a thousand years BC. Another comment from Eileen, she says, I think Cynthia Bettison uncovered one of the stone benches, like you were talking about for Pac and May. Oh, uh, cool. Found one of these at the Lake Roberts Vista site. So I did not know that. that. Okay. I will check that out. Um, Eileen also has some comments about T doors, and she's maybe working on a presentation for a PECOS conference. So I will put her in touch with you. Okay. okay. The DNA for members of Baca Bay, we've gone over some more from Eileen that I'll just forward to you directly. Here. Um, from Deborah, can you say a bit more about the quote danger of members pottery? Um. <sighs> There are objects and uh, things that are used in Pueblos today, and I'm not betraying any confidences here, that uh, are hot. Okay, when I worked at the Museum in New Mexico, uh, we had, I think they were paper mache, kachina masks that were made by WP or yeah WPA artists back in the day, uh, and 
you know, you're like, this is in Santa Fe. We, we have Indians, you know, Pueblo Indians in all the time. And I'm walking them through collections there one time and they, they want to look at this, they want to look at that. Pull up in the door with these things that are made by white guys, all right? And they are paper mache uh, replicas of real Kachina gear. And they were, the, the Indian people, the Pueblo people that were there said, this is really wrong. You know, when we're done with those things, we take them, take them apart. You know, we take all of the ears off and the nose off and all that. So we take them all apart because they're dangerous. You know, they, you got to know what you're doing. You got to know how to use them. They're wonderful, you know, when, in, when, in the right place and time. But otherwise, you know, you need to um, disassemble them. And we actually, I think, wound up giving them those paper mache masks so they could do what they wanted with them. Because, uh, you know, they were really concerned, concerned about everybody's health. Uh, there are things that are uh, hot, that are spiritually hot, you know, ideologically hot, that you don't want lying around the village. Uh, you know, the, there's a, the example I'm thinking of is uh, Mantle's Cave, way north, you know, did some work up there, or work on collections anyway, that consists of nothing but, but uh, cyst after cyst after cyst of just wild stuff. Uh, flicker feather headdresses and this and that and the other thing and uh, we have those collections in Boulder and uh, I would show them to every Pueblo group we, we had almost every Pueblo came through the museum when we were doing Nagpur and I you know if we had time I'm show those collections they're from you know they're from Dinosaur National Monument you know way far northwest Colorado and one group and it actually wasn't Pueblo people it was uh, somebody from the Great Basin said you know what you got here is like a drugstore where each one of these is what you need for a ceremony and they put it in this cave because they didn't want it around the village. And we don't know what the ceremony is, but that's probably what's going on here is it's being stored away from the village because it's dangerous, unless you know what you're doing, unless you, you know, use it for the right thing at the right time. I think the members' images in the, uh, you know, in the pottery, many of them are cute little bugs and birds and stuff like that that we like on t-shirts, but then there's, you know, guys cutting up guys' heads off and, and stuff like that, that it's ideologically charged. And I think that's why nobody else wanted it. I mean. We have collectors that pay tens of thousands of dollars for that stuff, but I don't think you could, you couldn't give it to somebody from Chaco. They didn't want it. Okay, Eileen had a question. Do you know of any tea doors in members? No, I don't. Um, an issue here is that most member sites, there are some member sites that are pretty well built, um, uh, you know, but most member sites, the walls aren't standing tall enough. Uh, you'd have to, I'm not aware of any tea doors in member sites. Uh, there's a tea door at Gila uh, Cliff Dwellings, big one, great big one. And there's another, another over in Montezuma and there's a couple in Sierra Ranches that are contemporary with Pakime. I think those are sort of Northern outliers of those tea doors. But I don't know of anything in members times that has a tea door in the imagery. Um, you know, the tea shape, uh, it actually shows up on, on uh, Ancestral Pueblo, uh, like Mesa Verde mugs and the handles will cut a little tea in there. Um, you know, it's not a door, it's a representation of the T, whatever the T means. At Pakime, uh, when De Peso dug there, he found two stone altars that were, you know, like two and a half feet tall and, you know, foot and a half wide and just beautifully made out of some fairly hard stones with a big T cut in the middle of it. And not big enough for anything to get through, you know, at least not anything human to get through. But the shape itself really meant something. You know, it's not a, not because you have a backpack on, <laughs> you know, the shape meant something. And I forget what the original question was. Oh, members' tea doors. No, I'm not aware of any members' tea doors. Um, but you know, it's possibly because the walls are so reduced, you wouldn't you wouldn't see the you wouldn't see the shoulder on the tea because the walls are too far gone. Okay, I, I had a couple of raised hands. If you can take three more questions, and then we'll yeah, take yeah, there. Sure. Why not? We appreciate your indulgence here. <laughs> okay, Linda. Uh, Linda Shank, you want to go ahead and unmute and speak? If Linda's still here. She's on mute. Looks like you're, you're muted, Linda. Yeah, you need to unmute your microphone.
Okay, I'm not getting any response, so I'll go to the next one. Ronald Moses, you could go ahead and unmute. Ronald, are you there? We outlasted him. Maybe so. He's still in the participants list, though. Okay, I'm not getting any response here. One more, Susan Markley. You can go ahead and unmute. Uh, I clicked it by accident. I don't actually have a question. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Hi, Susan. Thanks for your talk. I enjoyed it. Good. Okay. Well, Bill, do you want to go ahead and wrap things up then? Uh, yeah. When, uh, I made a note that Steve's offering a four-session course called Archaeology of Chaco Canyon, something he knows a little bit about, on March 30th and uh, early April. Uh, through the School of Advanced Research. And you can go to your Google School for Advanced Research Lexon course. You can check that out. That Bill, I didn't mean to I think it's already sold out. You can try it, but I think it's already sold out. Okay. Get on that waiting list. Okay. That's uh, all we got. So thanks again, Steve, on uh, behalf of Old Pueblo. It's a good talk. Um, and if, remind you again, if you consider making donation to Old Pueblo to help uh, pay for Steve's dinner tonight or for any of the Old Pueblo educational programs, um, Al already gave you directions for how to do that. So thanks again, Steve. It was very sure. good. Good thanks to see y'all. Tuning in. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you everybody who tuned in.